Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm Dr. Shemasyan and I've been helping students get into med schools like Harvard, Emory, and Georgetown for over 15 years. Today we're gonna be talking about the best extracurricular activities for medical school. I'll tell you which activities are absolutely necessary how much time you should be spending on each of them, and how to approach them so that you can stand out on your med school applications and maximize your chance of getting accepted. I often browse the Reddit pre-med forums and Facebook groups to get a better sense of what pre-med students are most concerned about. One day, I found a few variations of the same question. How can I stand out among all other medical school applicants? I laughed. I wasn't laughing at these students' confusion about how to distinguish themselves from the competition, in fact, it's an incredibly valid question that many, if not all, pre-med students will ask at some point in their journey. Rather, I laughed at the frequent use of the word gunner that followed in the comments. These gunners are the ones who are involved with every single pre-med club on campus and don't seem to sleep because that would take time away from shadowing, volunteering, research, and humanitarian work. I met many students like this and chances are, if you haven't met one yet, you'll meet one very soon. Because their dedication and accomplishments are nothing short of spectacular, you can't help but compare yourself with them and feel average as a result. The stress builds up because you constantly feel like you're behind and not doing as much as everyone else. You end up thinking that they're smarter or just wired differently. How could you ever compete with them? Is this even the right way to quote, be pre-med? On the other hand, if you yourself are a superstar pre-med student, you're probably wondering whether you're using your time optimally. You're conducting research, you're shadowing doctors and volunteering in the community, but are you getting enough hours of each? Are you missing anything critical? Are your extracurriculars the right ones? These are all valid and important concerns. After all, building a unique extracurricular profile can mean the difference between getting into medical school and having to reapply. Your time is limited, so it's extremely important to use it efficiently to maximize your chances of getting into med school. With medical school prerequisites, there's little guesswork involved. But what about extracurricular activities? Wouldn't it be nice if you had a clear guide that told you how much time to spend on each one? Then you can spend less time on activities that you don't love and dedicate the remainder of your hours to the ones that you do love. Fortunately, this information is publicly available. The University of Utah School of Medicine outlines their required extracurricular activities. And although these requirements won't apply to every medical school, it certainly serves as a useful set of guidelines for every serious pre-med applicant. The link to the recommendations page is provided in the description box below, but let's go through them together now. Community volunteer service. Medicine is a career of service, so admissions committees or adcoms want evidence to demonstrate you understand the service mentality. The University of Utah describes community and volunteer service as involvement in a service activity without constraint or guarantee of reward or compensation. Please note that your service can be medically relevant, but it certainly doesn't have to be. Developing community gardens and urban food deserts or leading after-school writing programs for students from low-income backgrounds is just as meaningful as providing music entertainment at the local assisted living facility or ushering patients to their respective stations at a community health fair. Utah requires a minimum of 36 hours within the last four years. To be competitive, they suggest at least 100 hours within the last four years. But based on my years of experience, if you want to stand out, you should accumulate at least 150 hours within the last four years. The second category, physician shadowing. The training to become a physician is extensive. So adcoms want to see evidence that you understand a physician's day-to-day -day work. Adcoms want to ensure that they're going to dedicate a highly competitive seat at their medical school to a student who will still want to be an excellent physician after seven to 12 or more years of additional training. The University of Utah defines shadowing as the observation of a physician as that individual cares for and treats patients and carries out the other responsibilities of a medical practice. Please note the emphasis here on the other responsibilities of a medical practice. Physicians don't only conduct patient visits, they're also responsible for patient documentation, discussions with insurance companies, and management of teams, among other things. An important component of shadowing is understanding the entirety of a physician's life at work, from the time they walk into the clinic to the time they leave it. At minimum, Utah requires eight plus hours of shadowing, and to be competitive, they cite 24 plus hours. I recommend you shadow two to four physicians for 50 to 100 hours total across multiple specialties and medical contexts. For example, inpatient medicine versus outpatient medicine or medicine at a community clinic. This breadth 
will serve as evidence to AdComs that you know what a doctor does. As a physician, your main responsibilities are to serve patients and treat their illnesses. As a result, you'll have to dedicate many hours to understanding the patient-provider relationship by working hands-on with sick people. AdComs want you to develop your interpersonal skills, especially with patients who may be more vulnerable due to their health status. The University of Utah defines patient exposure as direct interaction with patients and hands-on involvement in the care of conscious people in a healthcare-related environment, attending to their health maintenance, progression, or end-of-life needs. Please note that patient exposure is a very active experience. You're expected to directly interact with and attend to the needs of these patients, as opposed to shadowing, which is much more passive. The University of Utah requires a minimum 32 plus hours of patient exposure and 48 plus hours to be competitive. To be a standout applicant, I recommend over 100 hours of patient exposure at minimum. In fact, the majority of your hours should be dedicated to patient exposure since it provides the best insight into clinical medicine. Before we move on, a quick note on clinical scribing, which has become a very popular extracurricular over the years. This activity is classified somewhere between shadowing and patient exposure. While it's more active than shadowing, it's a little more passive than traditional clinical experiences where you have direct interactions with patients. Now let's talk about leadership. Medical schools simply don't have enough seats to accommodate the number of applicants. As a result, medical schools look to admit students who will be more than just clinicians. Adcoms are looking for the medical leaders of tomorrow, physicians who will push forward the boundaries of biomedical science, medical education, or healthcare reform, among other things. What's more, being a physician inherently requires you to understand how to lead a team of healthcare providers. From communicating with insurance companies, to delegating important responsibilities to social workers, to making difficult decisions when there's no clear answers, physicians are expected to be at the forefront of a team that serves patients' needs. The University of Utah defines leadership as a position of responsibility for others with a purpose to guide or direct others. At minimum, they require one plus leadership experiences lasting three months within the last four years. And to be competitive, three or more different leadership experiences, each lasting three months within the last four years. My recommendation is in line with Utah here. Look to the extracurricular experiences that you're already involved with and see how you can elevate your responsibilities there. A leadership title like president of a club is not necessary. Rather, it's important that you demonstrate leadership wherever you spend your time. Let's now talk about research. Medicines is an evidence-driven profession. As such, the evidence changes over time and the field of medicine adapts to these advancements in biomedical research. Adcoms, especially at more prestigious medical schools, expect you to conduct research to demonstrate your scientific literacy and ability to contribute to the field. This will give you vital experience in understanding and processing scientific literature so that when you're a physician, you can keep up with medical advancements. The University of Utah defines research as involvement in a scholarly or scientific hypothesis investigation that is supervised by an individual with verifiable research credentials. At minimum, Utah requires participation in hypothesis-based research, whether that's in a lab or part of a class where you answered or tested a hypothesis and received the grade. But to be competitive, they require the completion of hypothesis-based research outside of the classroom that is supervised by an individual with verifiable research credentials, including independent research or a senior thesis. These recommendations are slightly more abstract. Concretely, I'd recommend at minimum one year or more of research in the same lab. Whether you work in a wet basic science lab or a dry clinical research lab is not important. You can study zebrafish embryology or perform retrospective patient data analysis in an orthopedics lab. Both are completely fine. However, what's most important is your long-standing commitment to this lab and ideally your publication record. I say ideally because publications are not required and not having a publication won't hurt your application. Rather, having a publication will elevate your research experiences. The University of Utah's extracurricular requirements end there, but before they do, they offer one very important caveat. They make it extremely clear that to gain admission into competitive medical schools, you do not have to be spectacular in every single component of your application. In fact, the students that I routinely help get into top medical schools are usually not. Now that you understand the foundational extracurriculars, let's discuss how the very best applicants pursue their extracurriculars the right way. 
then chances are that you know some pre-med students who have an it factor. These are the students who, as undergrads, published their research in a previous journal or founded a nonprofit organization that minimizes food and health disparities in low-income communities or directed a, an after-school math program for high schools in inner city neighborhoods. To no one's surprise, these students end up donning white coats from schools like Harvard or Northwestern or Stanford. The point here is that one extracurricular activity is not inherently more important or better than the others. This is good news. Medical schools don't necessarily want well-rounded students. They want well-rounded student bodies, ones with a group of superstars in their respective fields. That said, you don't have to be a superstar biomedical researcher if you want to get into UCSF. You don't have to be a once in a lifetime community advocate to get into Yale. You don't need to look to your accomplished peers to copy their extracurricular activities. In fact, I'd argue that if you do so, you might be able to copy what they do, but you won't have the passion or expertise to replicate their accomplishments. Instead, look deeper inside yourself and be honest with how you want to spend your time. Figure out where your passions lie and put in the effort to create the impact you want to make. In doing so, you'll become great at something you genuinely care about and consequently, you'll stand out and be memorable to adcoms. If that hasn't convinced you yet, you'll also inevitably reduce your stress by focusing on fewer things. You won't need to play the gunner pre-med game anymore where you have to juggle so many things at once. Now you're probably wondering how you can become a superstar in your chosen area. Just because you're passionate about research or underserved community doesn't make you unique. So how can you stand out? How can you be the best in your chosen area? A first author publication in Nature or a healthcare delivery app that helps social workers connect with patients in need doesn't just come out of thin air. Do these sound impossibly difficult? I mean, there's no real way around it. It's supposed to be hard. At the same time, it is doable. Pre-meds before you have accomplished spectacular things and pre-meds after you will do the same. So what's the secret? Well, the difference between superstars who gain multiple acceptances to prestigious medical schools and those who don't, it's very clear. Many students often look for shortcuts or secrets to achieve things that require years of hard work. Every pre-med student wants to publish their research in a famous journal. However, relatively few will trade time with friends and families on evenings or summers to be alone in the lab, troubleshooting failed experiment after failed experiment before one finally lands. Many students also want to be the face of a successful and impactful organization. However, few trade their favorite Netflix show to spend time getting on the phone with collaborators who want to effect change in the same way. Whatever your niche, whatever your passion, you have to pour in time to do or create something meaningful. We all have 24 hours a day. So how is it that some people seem to just be more productive? Are they sacrificing so much more or are they simply that much smarter or more talented? Not at all. The main difference is the way they approach their extracurriculars. It goes back to focus. The most successful medical school applicants focus on fewer things and go deeper with each one. So once you've chosen the area you want to specialize in, take small steps to build something monumental. For example, if you've chosen research, conduct a literature review and present it to your PI, asking if they're open to mentoring you through this independent research project. If you've chosen community service, think deeply about what problem you wanna solve and for whom. Then begin to build the necessary infrastructure and relationships to put such a program in place. Remember the gunners we talked about at the beginning of this video? You now know that the most successful pre-meds aren't gunners who are doing every single activity in the book. Instead, you know these students as that guy or that gal. These are the pre-meds who are known to adcoms as the education in prison reformer or the post-stroke recovery researcher. Once you're able to achieve at that level, the end result will be the same, multiple acceptances at prestigious medical schools. A final word on being a pre-med superstar. Often, we only hear about the amazing things that pre-meds around us accomplish. Launching nonprofits, publishing substantial research, or developing a healthcare curriculum might seem so out of your reach. Because we only see the outcome, it's easy to discount the years of persistent hard work that went into these projects. When we're faced with the time and space to create something monumental of our own, it can feel super intimidating to do anything, much less something that's significant. We freeze at the mountain of work we have to climb and instead do nothing. Remember though, that mountains are climbed one small step at a time. Being a pre-med superstar is no different. I encourage you to take one step today, whether it's thinking about the type of superstar you wanna be or emailing that research lab you're eyeing. Take another step tomorrow and the day after that, 
and soon you'll have taken seven small steps in a row or 14 or 365 and when you're there you'll be able to look back and see just how far you've come and look forward to see just how close you are to being a superstar yourself. And that's how to choose the best extracurricular activities for medical school. If you found this video helpful, hit the like button. And if you haven't subscribed yet, you can do that here so you don't miss out on new videos. If you'd like to learn more, you can also click the link in the description below to get a free copy of my book, How to Get Into Medical School, which contains all of the strategies we use to help students get into medical schools like Johns Hopkins, Mayo, and UCLA. All right, thanks so much for watching. See you next time.